1907, this is what Woodrow Wilson said. 1907, this was, I don't even think he was yet governor of New Jersey. Well, he certainly wasn't president. Maybe he was governor. He was a political science professor and president of Princeton for a while and then, and then uh, governor of New Jersey and then president of the United States. In 1907, Woodrow Wilson noted the role that's played by the capitalist state on behalf of private capital. I quote him, since trade ignores national boundaries and the manufacturer insists on having the world as a market, the flag of his nation must follow him and the doors of the nations which are closed against him must be battered down. Concessions obtained by financiers must be safeguarded by ministers of state. Now you hear that? That's a bourgeois college professor, president of the United States. If I just read that statement, if I said, if I said the financiers are serviced by the ministers of state, the ministers of state have to safeguard the financiers. Uh, you know what people say? Oh, you're Marxist. Oh, you're Marx. That's Marxist, you know. I, I hear that. I used to hear that all the time. When I was, when I was just getting myself radicalized, I used to, you know, I, I used to hear that. I'd say things like, I'd say, you know, I think racism is actually... You say it's a failure of capitalism. I think it's a success of capitalism because it's, it's used to divide the working class. It's used to suppress wages. And my colleagues would say, that's Marx. That's Marx. I said, Marx? I thought that was Parenti. I look in the mirror. And I... <laughs> I'd say things like, you know, I don't think the police are neutral. I think, they, why in a strike they side with the factory owners and, rather, and not the workers? Why are they there defending the property and not the right of the worker who has an entitlement in the labor that he invests? And I say, well, that's Marx. That's Marx. I, I would hear this all the time. I say, you know, I don't think U.S. policy is so innocent. Da, da, da. We're out there helping the finance. Oh, that's Marx, they'd say all the time. <laughs> and I say, boy, this guy Marx was really something. You know, here I am. I'm knocking myself out trying to make an analysis. Every time I come up with something, they give him the credit. So, <laughs> that's pretty good. And then I realized, then I realized something. That wasn't Marx. That wasn't Parenti. That was reality. That's what it was. And reality happens to be Marxist. So let's repeat that sentence and go on. Woodrow Wilson is talking. Concessions obtained by financiers must be safeguarded by ministers of state, even if the sovereignty of unwilling nations be outraged in the process. Colonies must be obtained or planted in order that no useful corner of the world may be overlooked or left unused. Now that does sound like Marx, the manifesto. <laughs> the same wording, he says, capitalism goes into every corner of the world to recreate it in its own image and put it to use for its capital accumulation process. Interesting. Sometimes the flag will go in before the dollars get there, and that's to create new opportunities. For instance, in 1919, in Haiti, the people started a popular rebellion and revolution. They actually built a popular militia to try to get the land back from the landowners, uh, to try to get the big companies out of there and all that. The U.S. declared political instability. They have certain code words, you know, they use. Political instability, uh, undemocratic forces, we've got to defend it. Political in instability and, of course, Racism gets used very handily here. You say, oh, these little brown people in this little island have to learn self-governance. So we will have to go down and show them and, and, and at least bring law and order and stability back. So they went down just, just to just take care of that. And they stayed a mere 19 years. And they killed 18,000 Haitians. And they also kicked out the French... German and British companies and U.S. companies came in. You see, capitalism not only fights the class war against its own laboring class, capital formations will often fight against each other and against other national capital formations. And, of course, the people pick up the tab on that, too. Yugoslavia is a great case in point. Uh, I have a book there called To Kill a Nation. Got any more copies of it? Good. See, here comes the infomercial now. We start... <laughs> There it is, okay. Yugoslavia was tolerated for quite some time as a breakaway country 
from the Eastern Bloc of Nations, so-called Bloc of Nations. But after 1990, the U.S. saw no reason to tolerate its existence anymore. I mean, here was a country, a rather large country right in Central Europe, which was not which was not going the way of free market reforms as was happening in Russia, the Ukraine, Poland, and all over. They were not doing that usual thing. They were not, uh, at first they weren't. Yugoslavia had an economy that was 80% state-owned still. Yugoslavia had a high standard of living and a high degree of economic equality. Anybody could go to school to the highest level they want and medical care was free. Yugoslavia showed no interest in joining the European Union, no interest at all in joining NATO. It had a productive industrial base, a successful auto industry. 80% of the Yugoslav auto market was sold by the Yugo. It had construction firms that competed quite successfully and throughout, even in Western Europe. Now, when you destroy all that, you, of course, increase the value of your own capital. If I destroy your firms, I destroy your auto industry, I increase the value of my auto industry. If I destroy your agricultural base, I increase the value and open market opportunities for my agricultural base. And that's exactly what happened. German and U.S. agencies supported every retrograde secessionist and reactionary ethnic nationalist in Bosnia, in Croatia, and in Kosovo. And today, Yugoslavia has been broken up into a cluster of little right-wing republics where everything is privatized, everything's been deregulated, sold off to private investors at garage sale prices. That's the public capital of the people's labor is now given away to private investors, where the media have been taken over by uh, rich private investors or conservatives. Pension funds have been plundered and disappeared. Public services have been shredded. I was just in Belgrade uh, last March, and um, I was with a friend, and she said, well, I'm going to meet you later. It was a Saturday. I'm going to meet you later, uh, but I'm, I'm going to a doctor's appointment. I said, what do you mean? It's 7 o'clock Saturday night. You're going to see a doctor? Who, who sees a doctor at 7 o'clock? She says, oh, here in, in Yugoslavia, the doctors will see you anytime you want because they're so desperate for patients. The public health services are broken down, so people are literally without, unless you can pay, are literally without services. And seven was a convenient time for her, and the doctor said, okay, sure. There's inflation in Yugoslavia now, there's unemployment, poverty, suicide, prostitution, all of this has skyrocketed, and uh, we hear next to nothing about it in the press. It's a free market paradise. It has been brought into the fold of the West. That's Yugoslavia today. And unfortunately, there were too many people on the left who supported that war and swallowed, swallowed the official line. They swallowed the mass media line right down their throats. They thought they were fighting rape. They thought they were fighting a demon called Milosevic. And they didn't. And they were just ill-informed and taken in. It's much too bad. And I'm including some very notable, notable progressive speakers who swallowed that line, including one who calls himself a pacifist.